Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I just wanted to um, introduce Dr. Diane Young. She's the director of the social work program and the criminal justice major, and she's going to come up and say a few words about Michael Santos, who we are very fortunate to have here tonight. So thank you all for coming. Good evening. I want to add my word of welcome. Um, I'm so excited to have Michael Santos here. I first, I think, communicated with him about 10 years ago when I was an assistant professor at Syracuse University teaching my social work students about corrections and social work within criminal justice. And uh, in his book, I, the, about, I, he had written a book about prison, about his experience and about prison life. And so I required my students to read that book, and it was so engaging. They so got into it. Even when they didn't agree with them, they really got into it. And so we had some great discussions. And in his book, he invited people to communicate with him. So I had some questions for him. I, I wanted to know, uh, had he ever seen a prison counselor, and what did he think about counseling within prison? And could counseling be effective in prison? You know, all those kinds of things social workers wonder about. And so I sent him off uh, a letter, and he very quickly he responded, this typed single space, three or four page letter where he would answer my questions and sort of talk about things and uh, it was just wonderful. So then I could take that letter back to my class and engage them in uh, his responses. So Michael and I go back a little ways and uh, it's fun. this is the first time I've seen him in person and um, I'm delighted he's here. I want to give him lots of time to tell his story. It's very compelling. I know you won't be sorry you came. This will be really fascinating for you. But I want to tell you just a few brief things and then uh, turn it over to him. So Michael grew up in this area, actually. He grew up in uh, North Seattle area. And uh, at the young age of 23, he was ar arrested uh, for selling cocaine and locked up. And he spent part of his time right here in Pierce County Jail, which, as you know, is right here in Tacoma. So uh, uh, not, not that far from where those roots are. But while he was incarcerated in the Pierce County Jail, which was very early in his prison experience, and even prior to his sentencing, he made a decision, a commitment to work toward reconciling with society. That's always been important from him and so, to him. And so he decided to do that early and, and really got to work on it right away. During the long time he was locked up, he received a 45-year prison term, ended up serving, I think, 26 years of that. Uh, during the time he was locked up, he earned a bachelor's degree, he earned a master's degree, he wrote something like, uh, is it seven books, I think, something like that while he was locked up. So, so he has worked very hard to not only turn around his own life, but which probably happened fairly early for him in his experience, but to pay back, to contribute. And, you know, one of the things I absolutely love about Michael and his presentation is that he instills hope. Uh, He's, he spent a long time in, in a prison system that has many, many problems with it and was able to come out really such a wonderful person and so active in bringing about change. And he's very articulate about what we could do differently and how we could impact and make a difference on changing our prison policies and really doing a better job of corrections. We don't do a very good job of correcting. And uh, really, he's got great ideas about how we might make an impact there. So I think it's really wonderful. And so without, um, oh, by the way, he finished his obligation to the Bureau of Prisons. He was in the federal system in 2013. So he's been out now for about, out in uh, free and clear for about two years now. Um, so I, I know you'll love his enthusiasm, his energy, his passion. So Michael, come on up here and um, please welcome him. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I'm really grateful to all of you for coming out here and giving me this homecoming back into Tacoma. Because it, I, it, it really was, the, the only thing that surprised me, first of all, about Diane's uh, comments were that some of her students disagreed with me. I, I couldn't believe that. <laughs> so one of the things I want to say as I start this presentation is I will be totally open and transparent. And I would encourage you, if I say anything that suggests something that's different from your perspective, uh, please come on up and engage with me because I think that this can be much more enlightening for us to understand how our nation's prison system works if it's a dialogue rather than a monologue. And I want to just be clear, there is no subject I won't talk about, whether it's before my prison term, during the 9,500 days that I served, 
and what's been going on since I returned to society. So I'll be totally open and transparent. We have until around 8 o'clock, but I'm going to uh, stop. I'm going to try and stop around 7.40 for any questions after, but I can talk all night. So it's, I just wanted to let you know that it's open and transparent, and I would love for you to engage with me. And I think I'll start by, by telling you a little bit about my background and what brought me in to this system. Because I started off really... I, was, I, I spoke in a lot of classes today, and many of the students asked me about my background and whether I was, you know, from a, a, the type of background that would lead many, that leads many people into the prison system. And the reality is I was, and I, I grew up in North Seattle, Lake Forest Park area. I went to Shorecrest High School. I graduated in 1982, and my opportunities were, were many. I... I I should have taken the route of, of all of you that came to this great university and wanted to be a part of change and do something. But, you know, the University of Washington Tacoma didn't even exist back then. You're right. It was just, I only knew the University of Washington, and I was not on a path to go to the University of Washington. I just didn't have that mindset. I didn't have the good character and the discipline to do what many of you in this room are doing. And I was so impressed today as I spoke in three different classes and the level of engagement I received, I see some of the students here today, and they were so bright and so in tune with the criminal justice system, and it really impressed me, and it gave me cause to believe that this really is a time for change and transformation. And we're seeing a lot of it. In fact, last night there was news that 6,000 people in federal prison are going to be returning to society, and I'm really cheering that, that I think we can do so much more and throughout this presentation, I will be asking some of you to get involved in this change. Now, you said I had a history of Tacoma. My father was a highway contractor. And the last time I remember being in Tacoma was, and I don't know if that's a Narrows Bridge. I was just looking for some graphics to kind of walk me through this. But I remember when I was in that transition between high school or after high school, I was working for my father, and that was the last job that I worked on was it was doing some, an illumination project on a road that led up to the Narrows Bridge back in 1985 or so. But then, in 85, um, this movie came out. You know, I don't know if you know that guy, but uh, his name's Tony Montana and uh, Al Pacino. I, and I'll tell you exactly how it happened. I was living in North Seattle, and I heard this guy on the radio, the advertisement. So that guy sounds like a Cuban, and my dad's from Cuba. And I could identify the accent. And he may not have been a Cuban, but he sure sounded like the ones that I heard, right? And he sounded like my father. And, and, I, and so I was intrigued by the movie. And I went to see the movie, and I saw these fast boats and, and, you know, this fast life. And I thought, you know, I didn't get the message that I think that most people got, that it just doesn't pay to get involved in that. Either at the end of it, you end up dead. Uh, but I just saw the fun and the excitement. And, God, I was tired of working on that bridge, you know, and this looked like a lot more fun, and so I made this run to try and live this life, and, and I uh, moved to South Florida, right, from, from Seattle, and I started to figure out wh who's, what's the story with this whole cocaine business, how does it work, and I was doing my market research, trying to figure out what does it cost, how much does it cost down here, what does it cost in Seattle, what's the going rate, and I wasn't a substance abuser, I was just driven by wanting to have a good time, and that movie really inspired me, and it inspired my friends, and we decided to give it a try and go after having the same type of race boats in South Florida, and you're 20 years old, it's all good times, and fast cars, never thinking about the consequences or the implications of what I was doing, just totally oblivious to the damage or the role I played in, you know, introducing more cocaine into the country. And it was a bad time to be getting involved in that because we were just launching this war on drugs. Now, I see a lot of the students are pretty young. You weren't even born when I started my journey in prison. But back when I started, there wasn't a crack epidemic. There wasn't a gang presence all through society. We didn't have uh, the level of incarceration rates that we have today. And truthfully, I didn't even look at what I was doing as criminal. I, and it's self-delusion. I, I gave myself the story of 
what it was and every excuse and, uh, and just was living a lie between the ages of 20 and 22 or so. Um, but, you know, the DEA were on to me, right? They knew my friends, they knew what was going on, and some people started to fall. My whole theory on all of this was, well, if I never touch cocaine, I'm really not involved and I'm really not selling drugs. I could hire somebody else to pick it up and drive it and store it and deliver it. And my whole thoughts was that this is just some way that I could be enjoying the benefits without taking the risk. But it was really some flawed thinking on the 23-year-old's part because the DEA came after me. And it was on August the 11th, 1987, that I saw those guns pointing at me and I told, told to put my hands up and you know, when you got guns pointing at you and you put your hands up, you do it. And that was the last time that I walked in society as a free man. I'm still not free. Now, I'm, I may have finished my time in the Bureau of Prison, but I'm still not free and we'll get into that a little bit later because I, I really want you to know the whole story and I want you to know why it's relevant and because I believe it can have a role in improving a better outcome from our criminal justice system. And I think that's in the interest of every American citizen. For many, many years, people didn't understand the relationship between our nation's prison system and how it influences every American citizen. So this is try and venture into the waters of engagement. I'll ask how many people in here know somebody who's serving time in prison? Show of hands. So when I was growing up, that really wasn't the case. You know, I, I, I was a coke dealer, but I didn't know anybody who'd been to prison when I was in that business. And I would delude myself into believing that if I got caught, ah, I'd get probation or maybe a fine. But it was a different era I was starting. We'd launched this war on drugs. And this war on drugs meant that the penalties were going to be far more severe for a drug trafficker than for an individual that might be convicted of more violent offenses or direct violence and robbery and organized crime and you know bank robbery and things of that sort that was just that was the trend and I didn't see or appreciate that nor did I see or appreciate the way that society viewed my offense because I was just young and dumb and not very thoughtful, and was just after a fast life, and it was wrong, and so I had to get a lawyer. Right? You guys might recognize that lawyer from that popular TV show, Go Ask Sal, or what was it called, Breaking Bad? And uh, I look at the guy, and that's kind of like my lawyer was. I, I wanted a lawyer to tell me what I wanted to hear. What he told me was, there's a big difference between an indictment and a conviction. I said, yes. He'd be indicted, but I, yeah, my lawyer's going to get me off. Why? Because they didn't catch me with any cocaine. They, uh, they didn't catch me with any money. They didn't have any telephone recorders. I said, there's no way a jury's going to convict me. They're going to see me as a good guy. And I was wrong. <laughs> but I had this lawyer that was feeding me exactly what I wanted to hear. And because of that advice, and I'm not blaming him, I'm blaming myself for not really understanding the system, and, and accepting the responsibility of what I would have to do, I just wanted to get out of jail, and he told me I was going to get out of jail, but I didn't stop to consider that our motivations may be different. My motivations were to get out of jail, and I would pay all of my ill-gotten gains to get out of jail, and his motivation was to get his hands on all of my ill-gotten gains. So, it was a fundamentally different out outcome, and, and so I hired this lawyer from South Florida, not a very good idea, to bring to Tacoma. And so I've got this go ask Sal type of attorney who came to Tacoma and was going to represent me during this trial. And when I got arrested, I didn't really care about whether I was going to plead guilty or not guilty. I just had to defer to my lawyer to give me that type of guidance because I, I really didn't understand this. I'd never been confined before. And said, so, well, if I got to plead guilty, I'll plead guilty. If I got to go to trial, I'll go to trial. I'm just not going to testify against anybody. 
I just want, that, that's all I want to do. Either, either I go to trial. He said, no, we're going to beat this because my theory, I don't know what was in his thought, but if he would have pleaded guilty, he wouldn't have been able to command the fee that he took from me by going to trial. Because a guilty plea is a lot simpler process than a trial. Well, we went to trial. And right there, in the, that's the courthouse that I remember in Tacoma. It's the old federal courthouse. It used to be in the post office. I never got that view because they brought me in through the basement in chains and shackles. But I went into that courthouse and stood trial and made a series of bad decisions during the trial. Because what I should have done is accepted responsibility, expressed my remorse, identified with the victim's of drug abuse and, and said uh, what I'm going to do to make things better and why I will never be a defendant in a criminal courtroom again. And that certainly would have advanced my position far better than the choice that I took. I didn't take that choice. And uh, the jury saw right through me. I actually got on the stand and lied and told the jury that I had, didn't do sell drugs that the prosecutor had it all wrong, and I'm just being targeted because I'm Cuban, and during the era of 2110, I, 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 it was just, a, you look back and I said, how could I have been so naive and so foolish? But I was. And something happened after that guilty plea. Then I stopped thinking about wanting to get out of jail and started to think about what is my life going to be like when I get out of jail? And I remember going back to the Pierce County Jail, and I remember going into one of those cells, Pierce County Jail, going into one of those cells, I think I have one there, yes, and, just, and I'd see the pain on my parents' face, my father crying, and, you know, you Came to, he immigrated to the United States, he escaped, he wanted to give me a better life, and, and he just would say to me, why, son, why, why did you do this? And I would lie, I would, I'd been lying to him the whole time, and I said, you know, I, I felt so small and ashamed, my grandparents wouldn't talk to me, and, you know, it was just a really traumatizing time for my parents and my family and everybody who believed in me, and I just I felt the weight of that guilt enormously. And I'd go back to my cell. That's the cell. And I remember sitting on that bunk. That guy looks like me. I mean, he's covered up in his pillow, just trying to think if he covers himself up and he's not going to see his problems and the problems don't exist. But the reality is they exist. And I was on that bench, that prison cell. And I remember sitting up on that little bench. And I pulled out. First of all, I started to pray. And I started to ask God to give me strength and guidance. I didn't ask to get out of jail. I knew that that ship had sailed. I was not going to get out of jail at that point. I was facing life without parole. And I said, I'm going to be in here. And I said, God, just give me the strength to get through this. Give me the strength to get through this. I don't know how I'm going to do it. Give me the strength to get through this. And through those prayers, I got led to a philosophy book. And that's really what had the the power to transform my life. I didn't know how to spell philosophy. I didn't know what it meant. But I had this book. It was thick. I picked it up in the Pierce County Jail, a book cart. And I took it to my room, and I, and I just thought, maybe there's something in here that can help me while I'm in this really difficult time of my life. And I start flipping through the pages, and I come across the story of Socrates. So does anybody here know the story of Socrates? Does anybody? One hand, one hand. Ah, you know what we love in this class. What is your name? Hi, Jill. Jill, this group really would love to hear, would love to hear, Jill, what you remember about Socrates. And it, I remember he always questioned everything. Socratic questioning. You 
are, that, I want to just, I want to repeat it because they're recording this and I didn't get you over to the microphone oh. and they all have to forgive me because I'm kind of a new presenter. But I'll tell you what Jill said. She said, she spoke about, she said, her answer was that Socrates asked questions, right Jill? And you said that he, through questions, he could find answers and he kept asking relentlessly questions. Relentless. Anybody else remember anything about Socrates? Yeah, oh, we've got, a, we've got, we've got another participant. Yes, what is your name? Please come to the mic. Yes, come to the mic and be a part of changing history, which we are doing at the University of Washington in Tacoma tonight. So, okay. so one thing I remember about Socrates, besides the Socratic method, is that he was brought upon charges for corrupting youth, and he took responsibility for that, um, and he drank the hemlock, which took his life. Perfect. Both of you, Jill and Emberline, I want to thank you, first of all, for the engagement. And second, <laughs> thank you. And second, I want to thank you for truly bringing back exactly what went through my mind when I was in that cell. Because I read that story, and it was just the fact that Socrates was in a jail cell that spoke to me because he was going to be executed. And somebody came to see him. His name was Crito, his friend, in the jail cell. And Crito said basically, I'm not going to say it as eloquently as Socrates or Plato, but what he said was, it's all good, nobody really wants you to die. We're gonna, the jailer's gonna open the door, we're gonna take you out, you're gonna live. Socrates listened, and he said, well, that's great, but I'm going to stay here. And Crito looked at him and he said, what do you mean I went through all this trouble to get you to break out? And it's foolproof. And you're going to leave. He said, I'm going to stay. And Crito said, but you're going to die. And Socrates said, yes, I'm going to die. And I remember, that's all I wanted. Get out of jail. But Socrates said, no, I want to stay. And Crito said, but why would you do that? And Socrates started, through his Socratic questioning, spoke about what it means to be a member of a democracy. And he said, basically, in a democracy, we have to take the good with the bad. Socrates said, I've taken all of the good. This country has clothed me and fed me and protected me from foreign enemies and educated me, and I've accepted all of that. I don't agree with this law. And the law was, it was against it. The powerful had a law that said, if you're a member of the elite class, you can learn and educate yourself. If you're a slave class or the poorer community, you cannot learn and educate yourself. And Socrates believed that there was power in every human being and chose to teach. And he was convicted and sentenced to death. So he said, I don't agree with this law. But in a democracy, I have the right to work toward changing laws I don't agree with. I don't have the right to break laws. And I'll still remember sitting down on that bunk, feeling as if the walls are closing in, seeing extinguishing my hope, and I put that book on my chest, and I start saying, that's what I gotta do. I gotta find a way to do that. What's your name? Brandon. Hi, Brandon. Nice to see you. Good shape. I start thinking about Brandon back then. I start thinking about, <clears throat> is there anything I can do when I'm in here? Anything that would help me connect with Brandon, help Brandon see me not as a Coke dealer, but as a good citizen? Anything. And ask, I'll ask you, is there anything that somebody in prison, anything that that person could do? Is there just yes or no? Let's see a hands of no. How many would say no? There's nothing somebody in prison can do to reconcile with society. Are there any hands? So we're in unanimous agreement. Everybody agrees that there's something somebody could do. There's always a possibility. No hands disagree with that. Okay. I came up with that same answer. There's got to be something. Something I can do. But I didn't know what it was. And I just kept using Socratic questions. Well, what did Brandon want? 
What would anybody want? What would America want? How would it work better? Because I didn't even know how much time I was going to get. I know I'm facing life, but I don't know what's going to happen. And that's just my guide, my mentor, to give me hope. And so I just say, I'm going to change my life. I don't know how. And I'll look around. Can I borrow that? Just for a second. Just that. So I had one of these. It's an awesome tool. Awesome tool. It wasn't this big, because this would be a weapon in the Pierce County Jail. It's about this big. But I sat on that jail cell bench, and I wrote a letter to the Tacoma News Tribune, because they'd been covering my trial. And I said, wrote in this letter to them, I'm going to change my life right now. I hadn't been sentenced yet. And I said, look, you've written about me. If you really want to know the story, I really want to draw a line in the sand right now. And I want to become a good citizen. And this is what I'm going to do. And I don't know how much time I'm going to get, but I want to change my life. And I don't remember the exact words. It was 25 years ago. And I wrote it in that jail cell. But I sent the letter out it's before I was sentenced. And a reporter from the Tacoma News Tribune comes out and visits me in the Pierce County Jail. It was awesome. And he gave me an opportunity to talk with him. And I wanted that so badly, to just connect and not be a drug dealer anymore, but start sowing this seed to say, I want to be a good citizen. And so they came out and they took this picture. And I, I was in the jail, and that was our thing. And that was me. I said, I'm going to change my life. That was when I went in, in the Pierce County Jail. And the article ran on the front page of the newspaper before I was sentenced. And so I'm going to get sentenced, and it's a big news, because it was a front page article in the local paper, and the judge read it, and the jury read it, and everybody read about this guy who's drug dealer, kingpin, says he's going to change his life. What would be your reaction? Let me ask. What would be your reaction if you heard Yeah, cynically you're saying that, right? You hear that from everybody in jail, right? And it was no different for me. I, I was in jail, and, and I made this statement, and, and, the, and the, I'll never forget, ever, the government's response. Ken Bell, U.S. Attorney, Department of Justice, stood up, and he said after, he said, well, Michael Santos says he's going to change his life while he's in prison. We believe that if he spends every day of his life working in an all-consuming mission to make society better and repair society, and if he lives to be 300 years old, our society will still be at a significant net loss. I always remember that. Because it was so, it so eloquently captured what our prison system is all about extinguishing hope and telling an individual that regardless of how hard you want to work, how much you want to reconcile, nothing is going to matter except the bad decisions you made. And that's a fundamentally different approach that what makes a great university like this part of the American fabric of society because in this university we tell people study hard, earn good grades, contribute to society, and you can become anything you want. Live a life of meaning and relevance. But when we were embarking upon this path of mass incarceration, we sent a different message. And then the judge sentenced me to 45 years. In, in segments, in installments, but running consecutively. 35 years for the initial crime, 10 years for crimes that were ongoing while I was in the Pierce County Jail for a total of 45 years. And I didn't know what that meant because I was only 23. I didn't know what it meant to get 45 years. I didn't know about good time or... I knew nothing. I was just so green. All I knew was I wanted to think about each of you, law-abiding, tax-paying Americans. Someday, I know I'm going to sit across the table from you. Someday, I'm going to do something to make you see me as other, something other than a Coke dealer.
Don't know how I'm going to do it, but that's my thought process as I get tra transported in chains, on buses, in vans, in airplanes, and dehumanized. That's what I'm thinking about. Every step, I'm saying, what, what, what would you want? What would you want? What would be the best possible outcome for the people who are serving time in our prison system? Because in the, in the system itself, I was not getting that message. Whether it was the Pierce County Jail or my later experience inside, the message, the formal message is, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime. You got nothing coming. That's what the message. Now, I can say that in the Pierce County Jail, I was blessed to have had interaction with one officer. I, I would love to connect with him again, but I don't know how. I remember his name was Wilson. And when I was reading philosophy, he remember came into my cell and he was sort of asking me about philosophy and he started telling me about different philosophers that I should read and telling me that this is maybe where you are now, but maybe you could come out differently. And it inspired me a lot because I wanted to believe that to be true, even though the formal system itself was telling me, no, you cannot become anything else. Any rock and roll fans in the room? There's a song by Queen that, that, that sings that, the Bohemian Rhapsody, that's kind of talking about, we will not let you go, we will not let you go. You know, and I always used to think when I was running in prison, I said, that's kind of what it feels like, that regardless of what you do, nothing matters. And it doesn't matter, there. it transitions in the, into the penitentiary, and that's where I went, the United States Penitentiary in Atlanta, back in 1987. At the time, the New York Times wrote it, described it as the most violent federal prison in America. But, I mean, you guys look at me, right, and you say, this guy's a big, tough, you know, he can handle anything, right? That's what you're probably thinking. <laughs> I went into the prison system, and it was fundamentally different from anything I'd ever experienced before. And I, I, I looked at this, and I know it's dangerous, but I had this vision of each of you back then. I'm going to get through this. I'm going to find a way. I'm going to come out of here whole with my dignity intact and be a good citizen, no matter how long it takes. And I later learned that I could satisfy 45 years in 26 years by getting good time. Does anybody know what good time is? Jill? <laughs> Jill, come on up to the microphone so we can get you on tape. Come on, Jill. Give a round of applause to Jill for joining the operation. There's the microphone. Jill, thank you so much for making this more interactive. You get a reward. If you were in school, I'd give you extra credit. I am in school. Yeah. Oh, I, I'm giving you, who's her professor? Look at the courage it took. Actually, <laughs> and she's, she's the director of my program. Well, she is right there. <laughs> so tell us what good time is. Well, the reason I know this is because my son went to prison twice. And they give you your sentence, but if you are a first offender, or sometimes even if you're not, it just depends on the offense and your classification, you get time off for it being your first offense, or you can get good time for some behavioral good things. It just depends on the prison system, your classification. He was in state prison. Okay. So the first time he got good time, it was because it was his first offense. Mm -hmm. Second time he got good time was because he um, had satisfied a certain number of um, his sentencing guidelines. Okay. And so they gave it to him again. So Thank he you. went from down from 10 years the first time down to four. And the second time he went down from 10 years again down to three and a half. Wow, he's a good guy. He, well, he's a good guy now. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Jill. You're does, now, does anybody have any experience in the federal system? Anybody? Federal system. Okay, so I'll have to tell you. <laughs> okay, because in the federal system, which is the largest system, many of you may not know this, but how many criminal justice systems do we have in the United States? Any, anybody know? Nobody knows? No professors? 
<laughs> we have 53 different criminal justice systems. Every state, 50 states, has a criminal justice code, a criminal justice system. The DC system is another system. The military system is another system. And then the federal system, the granddaddy of them all. 53 different criminal codes. And in the federal system, we have good time. That could satisfy in 26 years, but it's fundamentally different from what you described in the state. In the federal system, good time is really the avoidance of bad behavior. It is not the pursuit of good behavior. So that's a fundamentally different approach. All I've got to do in federal prison to get my good time is not get caught for breaking any rules. Okay? So what does that mean? That means that an individual who keeps up with the Kardashians, plays cards, and just doesn't stab anybody, is going to be treated the exact same as somebody who chooses to get an undergraduate degree, a master's degree, write books, the same thing. So my question for you is if we did that in society, how many would be going into debt to get your university degree, educate yourself, and work hard to try to become a good citizen and contribute? How many would do that? I mean, people in America strive to pursue excellence because it has a fundamental difference in your ability to live a fulfilling, relevant life. But in prison, we extinguish and obliterate hope. We tell people, regardless of what you do, nothing is going to change. And then we're surprised when 7 out of 10 people who go through corrections come back. We well, there must be bad people. <laughs> we don't look at the institution of corrections and say, what can we do better? We say, let's get more of this failure going. Let's build more prisons. And why does it affect every American citizen? Because the 75 or $80 billion that goes into keeping our prison alive, it comes out of universities like this one. It comes out of health care. It comes out of infrastructure. But the prison system? Thriving. Thriving. And so I wanted to succeed in spite of this recipe for failure. And I came up with this three-pronged approach. I said, well, if I'm going to think about how I'm going to reconcile with society, when I walked in there, I said, I'm going to focus on three prongs. One, I think this is what people would want. They would want me to educate myself. Two, they would want me to contribute to society in some kind of meaningful, measurable way. And three, they would want me to build a support network. If I could get the University of Washington to believe in me, maybe all of you could believe in me. And that was the approach. That was the deliberate plan. It was visualize success, set a plan, and then execute the plan as the days turned into weeks, the weeks turned into months, the months turned into years, and the years turned into decades. That was the vision that I had. And I want to try and put it in perspective for all of you. If we took today, who's in the classroom of 23 years old? Anybody here 23? One hand? 20, you raised your hand. I'm not going to call you up, but you raised your hand at 23. Okay, so you're 23 years old, and let's say that you were not the disciplined, good character citizen that you are, but you were the reckless adolescent that I was at 23, and you got caught, and you got into the system, and you got the same sentence as I had, you would have to maintain this belief until 2041. Now, does that seem like a long time to you? So it is. And yet, it was important. That was what I felt I had to do. 
And so I, then I started to say, well, it's easy to say you're going to focus on education. It's easy to say you're going to focus on contribution. It's easy to say network, but Brandon, right? That's your name? But Brandon would want more than that. And so I was thinking about the people I'd interact with, and I said, they would want more than me just to say it. They'd want me to define what it meant. And so I'd think again about Brandon. I said, well, Brandon would say, if an education, I would have to get a university degree. If I got a university degree, that's what Brandon thinks of as an education, is a university degree. I'm not the one who agrees that. I just thought that's what people would think. Publishing, I thought that, that became my way. That would be one way I could contribute to society in meaningful, measurable ways. And third would be building a support network. And that was really my plan. And I had to put timelines on it because I couldn't comprehend 26 years. I was only 23. I didn't know how to think of 26 years. When you're 23, answer me. Your name again is? Brianna. Brianna. So Brianna, when I was 23, I thought of a 30-year-old as an old person. <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> do you think that way? Be honest. 30, I mean, 30 year olds is old. Well, I got to tell you, I lived in a fast life, and, and that's just how I thought when I was 23. I couldn't comprehend 26 years. So I just broke it down into 10 years. And so I said, in 10 years, some kind of way, I'm going to get a university degree. And in 10 years, some kind of way, I'm going to publish something. At the time, I didn't know how to write a sentence, but I'm going to publish in 10 years. And in 10 years, I'm going to find 10 people that I don't know and that don't know me and I'm going to persuade them to believe in me. And that was going to be my path. That was what was going to liberate me in this world of confinement. And so I just had that pen and paper because I didn't have any money. And I had been a lousy student in school. And I wanted to get into school, but I was in prison. So I'd start writing letters to universities. And I don't remember exactly the letters, but basically they went like this. My name's Michael Santos, and I'm writing you from federal prison. I made some really bad decisions when I was 20 years old, and I sold drugs, and I really regret what I did. But I want to be different, and I want to contribute, and I want to learn, and I'm hoping, please, will you help me? Will you let me go to school? And you send one letter out, you know, it doesn't get answered. You send 10 letters out, it doesn't get answered. You send 100 letters out, you're going to get an answer. And I found the most incredible people in academia. And they started to reach, respond to me. And they'd write me and they would tell me, well, you know, we can do this or we can do that. And long story short, I got into a university and I was... All of a sudden, the first day the books came to me, I wasn't a prisoner anymore. I was a student, and I was working towards something, and I was going to make my parents proud of me, and I was going to make my grandparents believe in me again. And it wasn't going to be full of happy talk that I'm going to change, but it was going to be getting that university degree, and then publishing, and then connecting with people. And I felt so energized and motivated, even though I was staring down a very long road I could see that degree and what it would do in opening opportunities. And so I got my books and I started to study and I worked hard and then I got my undergraduate degree and I just felt like I was part of the university, but I'd never yet stepped foot on a university campus. But I'm interacting and I'm feeling as if I am part of the academic community. And in 1992, Mercer University awarded me my Bachelor of Arts degree. And now, I, I, I just wanted more. I couldn't wait to do more. And I wanted to go to law school. So I started writing letters to every law school in the United States. Just got a letter from the American Bar Association. Who are the law schools? I'd write them a letter. Same thing. I got my undergraduate degree. I want to go to law school. Not necessarily to be a lawyer. I just want to learn because if I learn more and I get this degree, maybe it'll help me transition into society successfully. And all of them wrote me back and said, we really like your enthusiasm, but the American Bar Association teaches by the Socratic method. And so Socrates, again, having an influence on my life and saying that you're, you've got to be in the community of scholars, not in the community of felons. 
and so we can't let you into law school. But one of the universities, Hofstra University in New York, the dean wrote me and he said, I, I really admire what you're doing and I want to encourage you, we can't let you into law school, but would you like to earn a master's degree? I said, yes, I would. Well, what would you like to study? And I wrote him back and I said, I really think that our nation's commitment to mass incarceration is one of the greatest social injustices of our time, and I want to have a role in changing that. And I would like to sign some kind of way to study prison so that I could get authority and authenticity. And so they structured a program. They said, if you can get through this probationary period, we will waive the GRE, and we will waive um, your residency, and you can get a master's degree. And it was just incredibly fulfilling. And so I began studying and looking for mentors and reaching out and writing and interviewing other prisoners to write ethnographies. And then I started writing papers that I would submit to professional criminological societies and they would present them. And I was really executing my plan. I was getting an education and through my education I was contributing to society by publishing these papers, these academic papers, and I was building my support network, and people were believing in me, and I was feeling alive. And as crazy as it sounds, there were times when I was in that prison journey that I thought, God, 26 years isn't going to be long enough for me to do everything that I want to do. So then I got my, my I, I was studying it, and I saw the trends of incarceration. I looked at it, and that's what really was convinced me that I had to study this. And I saw it wasn't only equally spread. It was, you know, the minorities and the people that didn't have a voice that were being more uh, tar targeted by this system. And I saw the costs, you know, where higher education budgets were being cut by 13%, but prison budgets had grown by 436%, according to the Department of Justice, over this period of time, and I wanted to bring more awareness to that and show people how and why it influenced every American citizen, because I truly believed there are some people in prison who shouldn't be in prison. Our prisons we should reserve as a resource that confines people who threaten society and not people who don't need to be there. And I remember the contract with America and Newt Gingrich talking about changing the law, incarcerating more people. In fact, the crime for which I was convicted, Newt said, we should change to a death penalty offense. And I, I mean, that was hard to read, you know? But I, I remember reading that and standing there proud. America, kill him. And I just thought it was absurd and I wanted to bring more awareness to it. And that's when I you know, pursued, I got my undergraduate from Mercer in 92, I got my master's in Hofstra, and then guess what? I was a husky. <laughs> that is right. I went to the University of Connecticut in a PhD program, and I was gonna get my PhD. One of my mentors was George Cole, who was the dean at UConn, and he was a leading textbook author, and he invited me to get my PhD there, and, I went through the first year and then the warden said, you know, we've had enough of this education stuff, right? So how many of you are on criminal justice? Show of hands. So there's an advanced course in criminal justice that you may not have gotten yet, but what it suggests is that the pursuit of a PhD threatens security of the institution. So they blocked me from getting my PhD after my first year. I know you're looking at me funny, right? But that's corrections, it's advanced. You haven't gotten there yet. When you get into the Bureau of Prisons, you will learn. <laughs> you will learn that education is a threat to security. Security, very important. Comes at a cost, high recidivism rates, but, but the institution, very secure, okay? So that put an end to my academic journey and I just had to pivot and started to think about what I could do. How can I change people's perceptions? How can I position myself to be like Frederick Douglass, the escaped slave that someday comes back and helps society recognize that slavery is wrong and mass incarceration is wrong? And so I used, you know, publishing to kind of get, and that was the book about prison that I published from prison. 
and the one that Diane used, and I felt so honored when she wrote me and told me she was using the book, and I connected with lots of academics from around the country. In fact, one of them was one of the leading conservative scholars. His name was John Diulio at Princeton. And John published an article in the Wall Street Journal that said, let him rot. And it was a movement toward building more prisons because John's position was that we don't know enough about reforming people, and so we should just incarcerate people. And he presented an economic argument suggesting that well, when somebody gets caught for one crime, the reality is that he's already committed 10 crimes, and those 10 crimes probably cost taxpayers $40,000 a year apiece, so locking them up for $40,000 a year is really a bargain, considering what they're preying on society. And maybe there's validity to that, I don't know. But he wrote that article, and I wrote him a letter and told him why I disagreed with his position, and I was just so thrilled when he wrote me back. And I was telling my friends tonight at dinner when I got it back, what it felt like to have this mail letter envelope come through the door of my prison cell from Princeton University. And I was, you know, fingering the embossed Princeton. <laughs> just feeling as if somehow I'm, I'm close to this Ivy League school and engaging in academic debate from a jail cell. <laughs> so, so, so you know, he wrote me, and, and, I, and then he said that he agreed with what I wrote, but in an op-ed piece, he can only write so much, and he sent me his books, and then I wrote him and told him why I disagreed with his books, and we became friends, and then I got transferred to another prison, and he brought his class from Princeton so that I could teach them one day in the warden's conference room, so it was pretty awesome. I'm in jail, and I'm teaching these Princeton students, and yeah, it was a real highlight, and that applause really goes to academics who make things like this happen, you see, because academics is really the bedrock of changing the world. It's what Socrates wanted 2,500 years ago, to really enlighten people with education and philosophy and helping people see what we can become, and not just a human warehouse. And so I, through that work, you can see that's my wife. It's not a very good photo. I was up at 2 in the morning last night looking for things online. I just typed in Michael Santos and Carol Santos, and I pulled it off of Google. So there it is. But my wife, <laughs> and I got married when I was in prison because of this plan. By writing, by writing people became aware of my work. My, my work got more well-known. And I didn't get 10 people, believe me. I got thousands and tens of thousands of people believing in me and I felt awesome and and then one time I got a letter and the letter came in the mail and i and it remembers she's not here so I can tell you um she said you used to know me as Carol Goodwin because I blame said Carol Goss and said you used to know me as Carol Goodwin and I thought to myself that's a funny way to start a letter I still know you as Carol Goodwin <laughs> and, so, and, so, and then she said, um, I really, it was a nasty letter, but not the kind of nasty letter that a guy in prison wants to get. It was a nasty letter. I said, it, was, it was saying that I can't believe you sold drugs. It's really bad. The mother of two kids, my husband was a substance abuser, and I divorced him, and really terrible that you did this. You, you know, you went to the same school I did. Why did you do it? And I, and I remember reading it. And I showed it to my buddy. I said, boy, she looks angry. She must be a Republican. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I said, I don't understand. Why she, I mean, I knew her, right? And, and I said, God, that was when I was 20. I'm 35. And so I wrote her back, and, and I said, yeah, you're right. You know, I made a lot of bad decisions. I'm sorry. I was 20 then. I'm 35 now. And, you know, I'm different, and I've been working. And that led to a correspondence and then a romance. And she came to visit me, and we fell in love, and we got married inside of a prison visiting room on June 24, 2003. And I still had 10 years of prison to go, and the only way we could be together was in this visiting room, in a far less intimate situation than here, because we had correctional officers that wanted to protect security, and so they would only allow you to kiss when she came and when she left, and they would dictate the amount of time I could spend with her. <clears throat> and so, but she was wonderful, and she opened this 
world for me that she became my liaison to society and I could write my manuscripts and send them home and she would type them and we built this plan and then through my work I was able to uh, earn revenues that supported her and she went back to school and got her nursing degree and it's just sometimes people ask me what are you most proud of the whole journey and it's really just being able to nurture a marriage from prison and that was me getting out on 2000 12. I wasn't really free yet. I transitioned from the prison in Atwater to a halfway house in San Francisco in the Tenderloin District. And that was like four days after, and I just got my driver's license. I got to tell you, you think that once you know how to drive, you'll never forget how to drive. So I got my license, but I tell you, you would not have felt comfortable knowing that I was behind the wheel of this vehicle because I didn't know how to drive anymore. I, I passed the written exam, and I went to take the, and I sat in the car, and I said, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing here. And, and, I, and I started to drive, and my wife was with me, and we went to try and practice around San Francisco, which is a very big metropolis, busy, and I learned something, that when you're in prison for 26 years, your body doesn't move faster than your legs can carry you. So your eyes adjust and you, you can't see the same way that you see. I don't see cars coming to me, and it's very disoriented, and I don't see stoplights, and I don't see stop signs so easily. And it took me four months of driving before I started to feel comfortable again. And, you know, so, but that was a big, a lot of people say, what's the hardest thing you had to learn when you can? I said, it was really two things, learning how to drive and learning how to eat with metal silverware instead of plastic. But I came back and I saw this big problem, public education dollars going to feed this prison industrial complex, and I thought, I want to make a difference. I want to do something to bring awareness. And I, and I, and I didn't know what I was going to do, but I was just focused on it. And <clears throat> I started thinking about how am I going to phrase this message? And how am I going to make a difference? And, you know, we'd like to point our fingers in the United States at other countries and accuse them of violating human rights. So I'm going to ask the class, but nobody that was in my classes today that heard this already, can I, can I call on a volunteer? Awesome. What is your name, young man? Richard, Richard you didn't have to come to the mic. <laughs> you are going to be on YouTube. Big round of applause for Richard. Richard, thank you so much for sending the courage to come across to us. Richard, I want you to do me the favor and help our audience understand what does human rights mean? I guess human rights to me um, is being empathetic to other situation, despite whatever situation you're in or the current situation you're in. Was that an easy answer for you, or was it a bit of a challenge? Kind of easy. Well, kind of easy. I don't, know that, hard for I don't me. know if that was the right answer, but that's okay. Like, so you just being, being on the spot. I think that's <laughs> good. Well, you did good. If we were a Toastmaster, you'd get it right there. You don't have to. <laughs> you never let the truth get in the way of a good story. But thank you, Richard. <laughs> thank you, Richard. And the reason I asked that is anybody else want to venture a comment on what it means to have human rights? Because I think we talk a lot about human rights. But very few people can come up, as he said, I don't know if it's right, he just said it. Very few people can say confidently, what are human rights? What are you violating? Yes, sir, come on up. YouTube sensation. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what human rights are and the violation of human rights. I believe it's having value and worth. Okay, good, I think you're right. Thank you, Peter, right? Yes. That's for Peter. Peter knows human rights. Now, I would say that generally we can all agree that human rights is having value, and it's generally agreed that it includes freedom of speech and freedom of association. Why? Because with freedom of speech, we can dictate, we can cause people to consider ideas. There were times in our country where it was against the law for a white man and a black woman to marry and fall in love. 
people thought for years, well, that's ridiculous later, but that was the law. And if it wasn't freedom of speech, we would never really know that that was a great social injustice. Gay rights. It's only a recent thing. It took somebody of courage to talk about it. it. Took people to bring it to the forefront and say, this is a social injustice. If people love one another, they should be able to love one another. But without freedom of speech, nobody would have considered that. Pardon? Yeah, but Ronald Reagan was a big proponent of the Constitution. Would he have supported it? Would they have supported it? Would Newt Gingrich have supported it 25 or 30 years ago? The reality is it takes the freedom of speech to get people to think about what's right and re-question what's wrong. Social injustice. There's a great story from Henry David Thoreau, and it's called um, Walden's Pond. I think it's actually on civil disobedience. And I always remember that. Henry David Thoreau opposed the Mexican-American War, and he went to jail for it because he didn't want his tax dollars, he didn't pay taxes, because he didn't want his tax dollars funding a war that he didn't believe in. And another philosopher came to see him in jail. He said, hey, what are you doing in jail? And Henry's response says, no, the question is, why aren't you in jail? You see, the only response to an unjust law is to break the law. Not just the law is not what makes things right, a law today might not be a law tomorrow. It's the quest for right, and it takes the courage to question. And that's what freedom of speech does, and that's what freedom of association does. It allows us to connect and communicate with each other and share ideas and build the democracy that Socrates was willing to die for and that our military wants to fight for. Okay? And so those are human rights. But if we're going to point our accusatory fingers at other countries that violate human rights, I can assure you that there are 2.3 million people in America today whose human rights are violated every single day. If we talk about freedom of speech and freedom of association, and that is a great social injustice that influences not only the people in prison, but each of you. Because if you cannot hear my voice when I'm in prison, as Diane was able to hear and her students were able to hear, you will never hear this argument about what we can do differently, what we can do better. So you're not violating only my freedom of speech, we're violating yours. Because the only message you are getting in taxpayers is the message of this people or this group that has a vested interest in keeping it going. And I wanted to change that. Because I was in prison in a different era. I got a lot of friends in prison serving life sentences for selling marijuana. Sounds kind of weird when it's legal right here. But they'll never get out unless a law changes, unless we talk about the injustice of it. Life in prison selling weed to consenting adults. Well, there was a time in the 1980s that we believe that's the right thing to do. I think that many people now question that because we have this people talking about it in dialogue. And I'd like to say that I learned a great deal from leaders about how to change and influence change. And Steve Jobs was really an inspiration to me when I was in prison. He had a saying that I read. It said that... <clears throat> Good artists copy ideas, but great artists steal ideas. So I was in prison. I was going to be a thief. I was going to steal ideas from great leaders. And I'd look at Steve Jobs, and I'd look at technology, and I'd look and I'd say, what makes technology great? How does it improve society? Because they begin from one premise. They look technology leaders, they look at a problem and they say, what can we do better? How can we improve this system? It, we wouldn't see airplanes, right? Boeing, we're in the land of Boeing, building airplanes. Let's say they built 100 airplanes and they had the same level of success as our prison system. 
So 70 of every 100 airplanes would fall out of the sky. Wouldn't be a very successful company. We wouldn't want to keep building them. But American prison system is different. If it keeps producing failure, what do we do? Let's build more. Let's make the sentences longer. Last night, we saw the news that 6,000 people are going to be getting out of prison, which I applaud. But not everybody applauded. I was reading the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, this, or Washington Post early this morning and reading the kind of the reviews on it, and I read some law enforcement officers predict crime is going to skyrocket. 6,000 people getting out of prison. But they don't realize the whole story. These guys are serving 10 years. They've already served eight. Got eight years of correctional therapy. Got two more years to go. If we let them out today, crime rampant. Two more years of correctional therapy. Well, everything's okay. <laughs> and the logic to that is why do people, would people accept it? I think people are less inclined to accept that today than three or four years ago. But there's always been this narrative, this narrative of why we need more tougher prisons, tougher sentences. It wasn't always that way. We incarcerate more people per capita than any other nation on earth. And if you're 25 years old or younger, that's all you know. There's a great analogy from that same Socrates book I read called The, the, the Allegory of the Cave. So for those of you who don't know it, maybe we can get a demonstration here. Let's see, do we have any shadows? No, I don't have any shadows. I can't get any shadows. Oh, well. Can I get four volunteers? Four volunteers. Be a part of the program. One, come on. Two, three, four, come on up. This is awesome. We're going to do Plato's Allegory of the Cave right here at the Innovative Campus, University of Washington, Tacoma. Hi. How are you? Good. I'm Michael. Theresa. Hello, Theresa. Ronnie. Hello, Ronnie. David. David. Yusuf. Thank you, Yusuf, for participating. First thing we're going to do, we're going to turn around. Oh. <laughs> OK. Now, for their entire life, from the time they came out of the womb, they have been fastened to a pole. They've never been able to turn their head. They've never seen anything except what is in front of them. That's all. That's all they've seen. That's all they've known. Okay? And so, when a shadow comes along, and they see that shadow, that's all they've known. They think it's a real moving object. But you know it's not a real moving object. They just don't know. That's all they've seen. And then one day, Yusuf, somehow, Breaks free. Thanks, Yusuf. He gets out. Hold on. That's, 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 Yusuf. And you look over here, and you've got your colleagues there, right? And they, and they see this shadow, but you now see. You've got clarity. You can see it's just a shadow, and you come back. Yusuf comes back. He wants to enlighten his team. Hey, this isn't real. This is just a shadow. Get out of here, Yusuf. <laughs> this is just, that's real, man. Thank you for the right. <laughs> Thank you for helping me illustrate as poorly as I could my little dramatic exercise. That was all. But I wanted to explain it to you why. That's important. Because if you're only 25 years old, the only thing you know is mass incarceration. Because we have been on a trajectory of taking budgets out of universities and hospitals and infrastructure and deploying it into the prison system and building more, and recidivism rates growing, and gangs proliferating, and we just say, let's do more, let's do more, let's do more, because nobody knows anything. But it wasn't always that way. In the 1970s, our nation confined people at the same rate as other enlightened civilizations, about 120, 130 per 100,000. Today, we are. 730 or something. If you look at the, the, the scales on that, we're so far ahead of anybody else. We incarcerate more people than like 20 countries combined per capita. 
And it's not only me saying that it's wrong. I'm not a disgruntled prisoner. I'm just somebody who's coming back and trying to be Yusef and letting you know, hey, this isn't the only way, right? We don't need to just keep people in for 10 years and 20 years. We didn't used to do that. We used to have systems where we could review a sentence and see whether prison is necessary and serves the best interest of society, like other countries. But not today. Somebody's going to do only eight years out of ten. We start predicting chaos and mayhem, and, you know, and it's just not true. The reality is, after I'd served eight years in prison, I was as ready as I ever would be to come back to society. I was 32 years old. I had a master's degree. I was a published author. I'd learned I wasn't the same 20-year-old. You'd spent $40,000 a year to confine me after eight years. But there was no mechanism in place to which there could be a review of, my, of whether incarceration was necessary. And so I served another 18 years. And I'd love to say it's only me, but the reality is, we incarcerate 2.3 million people. And the question is, does everybody there need to be there for as long as they're there? Justice Kennedy doesn't think so. Justice Kennedy says, we incarcerate too many people and they serve sentences that are far too long. Justice Kennedy says that in an enlightened country, we should not be afraid to temper justice with mercy. Eric Holder, the Attorney General, doesn't say it's good. In fact, the day that I concluded my sentence, he said, we need to redo, rethink the way our nation incarcerates nonviolent offenders. But the system has become, the whole ecosystem has grown around it, and so I've learned from Steve Jobs to think about it and say, what can we do differently? And I learned from, you know, people like Gandhi, who was really just a master of change and inspiring people to do better through nonviolent protest and education. And I learned from Mandela, a man who could suffer indignity for 27 years, not for having committed a crime, but because of the own injustice of his government, and yet emerge from that without any anger or bitterness, but rather just want to do well, do good, and make a better world. And so I was inspired by these people, and Viktor Frankl, who was a prisoner of Nazi Germany and watched his family executed the day he surrendered and have no anger or bitterness, but rather says, my role is to try and create meaning in the lives of others and help people face a struggle, because struggle is something that unites us all as human beings. The story that I'm giving you tonight may be one of prison, the context, but the reality is, this is a very human story. Because all of us, at one time or another, face struggle and adversity. And all of us need to figure out a way through it. I can tell you, since I've come back to society, I've met many, many people, successful people, who seem to be living in a prison that is far more confining than the prisons that held me for 26 years, because they're in a prison of their mind. And the reality is you've got to figure out ways to break through it, and we can learn it from masterminds like that. And when I got out of prison, that was my goal. Another three-pronged approach, to figure out a way to connect with people like you. And so I said, I'm going to take this three-pronged path. One of them is I'm going to create programs and products and services and distribute them to prisons and jails and show people inside how to change their lives and reject the criminal lifestyle and come back as law-abiding citizens. And one was to build bridges for the formerly incarcerated to transition into the job market. Another was to do this, to spread awareness. Ah, that's interesting. There's a typo there. <laughs> spread awareness. Spreading. I was two in the morning when I read this thing. So and I just got out of jail, so you know, give me a break. <laughs> so it's spreading awareness. And so, and, and, and that was my goal. And I got out, and so I started this program. It's called the Straight A Guide. And I teach this Straight A Guide, and it's basically, I teach it through my story. I teach it to people in prison. In fact, the Department of Corrections here in Washington State is a client. I'll tell you the story of how that happened in a funny little episode from it. 
But I'm going to basically tell you, we've got about half an hour or so, or 30 minutes, you know, 15, 25 minutes or so. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about how this program works. I told you my story. It's a values-based, goal-oriented approach to overcoming struggle. When I started, I figured, I thought about Brandon, and I thought of three prongs, education, contribution, building a support system. Those became my value categories, and that's what was going to give me strength. Then I thought about clearly defined goals. How was I going to define it? It would be a university degree, it would be publishing, and it would be building a support network. And those, those were like the prerequisites to get on this straight A guide. The next prong of this was once you established your values and you set clear goals, the next step was to embark upon the straight A guide, which starts with A. The first A is attitude. There are seven A's. But it all begins with attitude. You've got to have 100% commitment to success as you define success. I didn't define success by being a model inmate. I was not a model inmate. I made money when I was in prison. I got married when I was in prison. I published books when I was in prison. I went to school. That's not a model inmate. A model inmate is somebody who just goes to work, does his job, doesn't raise questions, doesn't bring anybody new into the institution, doesn't, you know, doesn't, that wasn't me. And so I spent a lot of time in the SHU, in the segregated housing unit. But my attitude was I never cared about being a model inmate. I cared about coming back to society, putting on a suit and tie, and having nobody guess that I served a day in prison unless I told them. That was my attitude. And so there was an aspiration as the second A. I was going to make 100% commitment. The second A was an aspiration. And I had a vision back then of connecting with Brandon, of standing on a stage and being able to communicate to the world. That was my vision of how we can build a better system. And three of the straight A guide was action. You've got to take incremental action steps to get us from where we are to where we want to go. And the fourth A in this program is accountability. Just like you have here at the university. You've got to earn grades. Well, same thing. If I've set values and goals and, and, I, and I make a commitment, I've got to have accountability with clearly defined timelines that determine whether I am succeeding or failing or whether I need to shift course. And the fifth A is really awesome it's awareness. And what that means is if I'm on this disciplined, deliberate plan, I become aware of opportunities that I can seize. The opportunities that opened for me were available for every single person in prison. But they weren't all aware of it. I was aware so I could seize upon them. But something magical happens to people who are on this path. The world becomes aware of them. Like Diane became aware of me, and she reached out, and she would open opportunities, and look at that. It may have taken 10 years, but now I'm here at this great university. Why? Because she was aware of me 10 years ago. And this is a pattern that over and over again. It's what I learned from masterminds. It's, you know, after awareness, there's achievement. It's celebrating every achievement, no matter how small, knowing that that achievement leads to the next. And finally, the seventh A of the straight A guide is to show your appreciation and express gratitude for the blessings that come your way. And although I talk about the prison system, the reality is I had many blessings in there. There were some staff members that were informally supportive of me and helped me. And my wife came into my life. And publishers believed in me. And university professors believed in me. And I was able to go through this period, and it really changed the outcome. So that when I came back to society, the first time I stepped foot on a university campus was San Francisco State University, and they offered me a job. I got out of jail for 26 years, and I was a professor for a year. And I'm in this prison, right? And, and and the students are, are calling me a professor, and I'm saying, no, I just got out of jail. <laughs> so, you know, it was really exciting, though, because I was executing my plan of helping these students understand what we can do better in our prison system. And there I am, Washington State, first time I came back to Seattle. That's Mike Colwell. 
who's director of industries for correctional industries in Washington State. This office is a bad iPhone picture, Michael Colwell, and at Safford Creek. And that is Dan Pacholke and Scott Frakes, who are the directors of the system. And I went to them and I went to sell them my program, the Straight A Guide. And I'm making my pitch. And all those guys were there, and Bernie Warner, appointed by the governor. And I'm showing them, regardless of where you are, it's never too early and it's never too late to begin working to be a law-abiding good citizen. And if the system doesn't provide that mechanism, you've got to succeed anyway. If you really hate prison, start thinking about Brandon, your Brandon. Start thinking about the employer you're going to have to sit across the table from someday. Start thinking about your probation officer that you're going to have to ask. Think about that probation officer. Ask those Socratic questions. Because everybody who goes before that probation officer is going to ask for what? More liberty. You've got to do something different. Differentiate yourself. And that's what worked for me. And now I go into prisons and I try and teach. That's in a jail. And the dudes look at me and they say, that fool was never in prison. <laughs> I say, you think you're saying that, giving me an insult because I don't look super hard. But the reality is that was a plan. That I could come out and nobody would know I ever served a day in jail. And that's the plan that I want for everybody in prison. To be able to come out, be your neighbor, shake your hand, smile at you, be a contributing, relevant member of society and not living on the margins. And my question is, would that be better? Would you as a taxpayer want that? Because that's not what our system is producing. But now's the time. When we've got the President of the United States going into prisons and talking about it. You've got Newt Gingrich, the guy who wanted the death penalty, now talking about prison reform. You've got the Koch brothers, used to fund conservative politics and keep things going, now talking about prison reform. This is the time. This is the time. And it's my job to try and do this, to do this mentoring and pull people who are living in struggle up instead of extinguishing hope. But it is a very heavy lift. Education plays a role. Doing so will provide employment opportunities for people. It will stop this revolving door of seven out of every ten people in prisons coming back to prison after they're released. It will instead, I mean, right now, the longer we expose somebody to corrections, the less likely that person is to function in society. And that's a flawed policy. When we have directors wondering what happened, it's bad and it's a massively complex problem. That's why it requires students to get involved. That's why it requires teachers to get involved. It requires the media to get involved. It requires citizens to get involved. It requires employers. It even requires the formerly incarcerated to get involved. Because this is an American problem. And the time is now to change it. And that's what I'm striving to do. And that's why I'm reaching out to each of you. And think about getting involved and joining me to end this terrible system where there is a, a powerful juggernaut that controls the narrative that leads to mass incarceration. Because they really dominate the message. And it's time to change that. And now is the right time to change that, to overcome these people that profit off of warehousing human beings. Because people who are living in those cages, some of them may not have been blessed as I was to get inspired by Socrates and Mandela and Gandhi and Viktor Frankl. Instead, they're listening to Big Red. You know Big Red? You guys know Big Red. <laughs> Big Red is telling them, forget about the outside world, man. One thing you need in here, be hard. Control the TV room. <laughs> That's awesome, right? <laughs> it's funny. People in prison, they, they're very personal. It's a lethal advance to change that channel, right? Can stay off the phone, man. This is my yard right here. This is my chair. That's the prison system. It's, 
It's very different from anything you've experienced out here, right? Move my chair, man. That's my chair, homie. I don't touch that. I'll kill you for that. <laughs> it's my manhood. You know, it's a ridiculous system, but it's when you take away hope and that's all they have, that's what you get. And we've got to change it. Because there's going to come a time when it's going to influence your family or your loved one. And we've got to recognize that it's wrong. Just like all their social injustices were wrong. And it's why all people have to get involved. Because there are a lot of people right now that are looking at children and figuring out in the future how many more prison cells do we have to build. That's a really bad policy. Instead, we should be focusing on what can we do better. And so I look, and I look at what's going on around the world, and, you, and for generations, the Middle East has been hailed as a hallmark of oppression and tyranny. And battles have been fought, and the military have tried to change it, but that didn't work. The only thing that worked was that winning the Arab Spring a few years ago, and I got really inspired when I was reading about it. I was in prison. But what changed it was social media. Because people were able to connect with other citizens who didn't know how the world operated, and they woke them up out of the cave. They were more successful than Yusuf in convincing his peers that this was wrong. And so they had an uprising, and they broke out of the cave, and they started to break tyranny. And we need to do the same thing. So I was in prison in 2009, and write this down, at Michael G. Santos on Twitter, Okay, that's when I launched it. <laughs> I registered, I'm going to do it. I'm going to use this social media as a tool to help more people become aware of the greatest social injustice of our time. Use social media. Get social. Talk about it. And then, because we will work for social change, and that's why my big call to action is here, the finale, as we come closer to the end, is to ask you to get involved. I would love for you to recognize why our system's commitment to mass incarceration influences every American citizen. And just like every social injustice, whether it was fighting for gay rights, fighting for equality, fighting for women's rights, fighting for anything that had meaning that has made America great, including the legalization of weed, which is just awesome, although I don't use drugs. <laughs> I just think it's cool that people now have the liberty to make their own decisions of what they want to do. I'm a huge believer in liberty and a, a great believer that Suppression and oppression is imposing values on others is a bad way. And I want to change it, and I want you to help me change it. And I want, that's why I'm calling out for interns, for people to get involved. And if we can get credit for it, get involved, and let's work with professors to figure out ways to get credit. If we can't get credit for it, then get involved anyway and be part of a grassroots movement to change this wretched social injustice. And I'll tell you what I'm doing. Show of hands. Anybody have an iTunes phone, an Apple products? Apple, Steve Jobs, great. So you got to go onto iTunes if you can to support the movement. Subscribe to the Earning Freedom podcast. Rate and review the show because that's the way I get distributorship. But let me tell you what it is. I did this podcast to do one of three things. I've got about 140 episodes on it. My whole focus is to spread awareness on why mass incarceration is wrong and what we can do differently. <clears throat> and I do one of three things in each episode. One, I share strategies and stories of what, it, what I was able to use to break away from the criminal lifestyle and focus on success and tune out the negativity and prepare. Second, I interview other formerly incarcerated people who emerged successfully. And I asked them to tell their story. What did you do in prison that helped you prepare for success? And how did it work out for you? And three, I interview community leaders, employers. And I ask them, what would you expect of somebody in prison to break into the job market? What can he do to get past these barriers? What do you want? And then I take these podcasts. They're not only free on iTunes to spread awareness of the kind of the country, but I package them and I send them into prisons. So people who are living in these, these communities without hope are listening and learning 
about what they can be doing today to prepare for success tomorrow. And so my call for interns is to get students involved, to get students involved so that you can learn more about real stories of people who have experienced the criminal justice system. Because I need help. I want people to help me do what happened in the Arab Spring. I want people to learn more about criminal justice. I want people to learn more about why it perpetuates failure. I want people to learn more about what we can do better. And if you're in criminal justice, what will you get out of it? You will get exactly the opportunity to do what you're studying for, to apply your knowledge in learning and listening to stories and then communicating it and working towards something better in a meaningful, measurable way, which will absolutely enhance your resume when you talk about trying to get a job in the community. You could talk about your experience and how many people, and you could show it. But also, you will build your network, because I communicate with correctional systems. And you could be talking with correctional administrators and talking about this innovative, disruptive program of a 24-hour reentry system, showing people who live without hope how to emerge successfully as law-abiding citizens. And that is a great service to the community, but it's also a great way to advance your education with real live work experience and dealing with people who've gone through the system. So interns are wanted and needed to help change this world. And I hope that you will reach out. Either reach out to me, and you've learned all types of ways to schedule guests and how we reach out into the formerly incarcerated population and invite them on to be a part of the program. We will use social media to blast this out through Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn, and those show notes will link back to the podcast so more American citizens will be learning about what goes on in that system and giving a voice to the people whose human rights have been suppressed. Because a lot of people don't understand what goes on in prison. People say, I don't know why these guys keep going out of prison and going back to prison. They don't understand the system and how it perpetuates that. And it would be our job to spread that message so that it becomes more talked about on university campuses, with the media, with politicians, and we'll bring more awareness, and we, that is the beginning of a grassroots program. And all you need to do to be an intern is have a computer and internet access. And everything else is in the cloud, and it doesn't matter where you are, you could have a role in seeing your work implemented every single day. And that's why I'm asking, give some thought to it. Reach out, be a part of something different. Instead of maintaining warehouses or talking about warehouses, let's talk about building a criminal justice system and a prison system that truly does correct thinking, that truly does help people understand they can become something more than a prosecutor who tells them, regardless of what you do, there is no way out. I want to show people there is. And I can tell you on the Earning Freedom podcast, I've got some amazing characters. One guy, a good friend of mine, alumni of the University of Washington, his name is Sean Hopwood, got out of the military, had some real tough times, thought Robin Banks would be kind of cool, was high on meth, started Robin Banks, robbed five of them, got 12 years in federal prison. But when he was in prison, he was on the same path that I was on. And he educated himself inside of a federal prison and learned about the law. And he found his mentors. His mentors guided him on the law. And he got out of prison, and he went and got his undergraduate degree. And then the University of Washington became aware of him, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gave him a full scholarship to UW Law in Seattle. He just graduated last spring. And this former, or actually the year before, this former meth user, bank robber, 
got a law degree, and went to the D.C. Circuit Court, which is the second highest court in the United States, and became a clerk. And now he is a fellow at Georgetown Law School doing his passion, which is a public defender work, but also teaching law students. And that's a story that nobody hears about. And I've got a lot of those stories of people who are former Aryan Brotherhood members, who did 20 years in prison, talking about how they regret the way that they did their time and how it conditioned them for failure. And on the Earning Freedom podcast, we pipe that into prisons. And I've got members of the Black Gorilla family or the Crips on the program, and they're talking about how they put the knife down, left the gang, and are now going into inner city communities and developing meaning in their life by trying to make things better. And you see, you put this on a podcast and you send it into the prison and more people start believing that maybe, maybe they too can have this type of an outcome. But it's not going to happen by accident. And I'm just one guy who's out here that's very passionate about it. But I'm going to tell you, I need help. And I would be very honored to work with this great university. And so if any of you are looking for that type of real world experience to understand the formerly incarcerated, to figure out what can we do better, to connect the formerly incarcerated to jobs, to spread awareness so that our taxpayers know why this is a bad system, Michael at michaelsantos.com and be a part of big change with small actions. We can change the world together. There's the contact information. And it's 740. You see, I've been watching the clock. <laughs> and so I made a pledge that I would only go till that long and want to thank all of you, first of all, for giving me your attention and invite you to ask any question at all. But if you do, just come up to the microphone and let's have a discussion. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, all of you. Uh, did I leave anything untouched that you might want to know about staff uh, or professors or students or community members? Is there anything that I should have spoken about that I didn't speak about? Well, I have a question I asked in class. Is that a student coming up? <laughs> Is she coming? It's awesome. So cool. Love engagement. It's like gets me high. So <laughs> what is your name, young lady? Hello, Annika. I'm good. Thank you. Well, there are, one of them, there are so many. But the biggest one I would say is that the system extinguishes hope. The system tells a person that regardless of what he does inside, nothing is going to matter. And was that not on? Oh, so she asked what my thoughts were. Would you repeat the question again so I can um, it's on tape? What are the barriers to helping the inmates find motivation? The barriers that I think are, are that the system itself, it tells you regardless of what you do in here, nothing is going to matter. And when that happens, people see no reason to do right. But simultaneously, a big barrier is that the staff is telling them nothing matters. The policies tell them that nothing matters. There is another voice that they hear every day from the gangs and the negative influences that are so pervasive throughout the prison system that it's pulling them in. And it's making them believe that nothing matters. And so since there are no opportunities to distinguish themselves in a positive way, they start to want to focus on building their prison reputation. And the skill set that it takes to function in society and, and be a good citizen, it's fundamentally different from what it takes to be a shot caller in the penitentiary. And that's what people are aspiring to become because that's what they perceive as respect, but it's not respect as you get respect. Are you a student here? I am. I'm a social work student, yeah. So you're a social worker student, and you're distinguishing yourself in ways that everybody here can respect and appreciate. You're going to get a degree and, and try and make a better society. But in prison, respect is different. Prison respect is people are going to fear me. 
And if I, somebody disrespects me, they know I'm going to respond by taking their head off. That's respect, which is why I control the TV room. Big deal in prison. You know, so I really think that the fundamental problem and obstacle is that there is no hope. There is no mechanism through which people can distinguish themselves in a positive way, in an immeasurable way. And I consider that a fundamentally flawed system. Um, I just wanted to say, um, I have been doing my field placement um, in a hospital, and I came across a gentleman who had been um, incarcerated, and he was, um, you know, sick, he had been homeless, was looking for a job, and had barriers of being able to find a job because of his um, prison sentence. And um, so that was just one thing that raised awareness to me of, you know, the problem with finding housing and getting into housing and being able to keep a job was something that I it's saw very problematic. It's a massive problem. Yeah. And a lot, of, a lot more people, I can assure you, have the problem that you just described than model the experience I had. And that's what I want to change. And that's why I need your help. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we can just sit here and look at each other. It's kind of cool. You guys can tell me what happened with the Seahawks these first two games. And in Orange County now, but I still want to know. <laughs> Again, we talk about Seahawks? No. OK. <laughs> um, how do you change the mentality of um, inmates once they get out to a more positive? Um, great question. It's a great question. And I, the way that I do it, I don't know that it's the only way. But the way I do it is I try and restore their hope and their belief in themselves. There's a movie that I used to teach from in prison. Some of you may have seen the movie Heat. Anybody, anybody not see the movie Heat? So you, a lot of you don't know the movie Heat. Was it? I saw it in prison, and I, and I want to share it because it's a lot of what I experienced, what you're talking about. There's a, there's a character. It's a bank robbery movie, and Robert De Niro and Al Pacino are in it. And there's a guy in the group, De Niro's a bank robber, Al Pacino's a detective, and there's a guy, it's uh, the guy that, that played on 24, and he's the Allstate guy, I forgot his name, but very famous African-American actor, very tall and distinguished, but he's, in the movie he's really hard, he did a lot of time in prison. And there's a scene in the movie where his girlfriend is taking him to a job as a short order cook, and she tells him, baby, please, just do this for me. Can you handle it? Can you handle this job? And you, and you can see he doesn't want to go to this job. And he looks at her and says, there's nothing I can't handle. And he goes into the job, and he just feels emasculated and dehumanized. And he's 35 years old, and he was the big shot caller on the yard. But in here, he's nobody. And he's disrespected, and he hates it. But he's trying to do it. And he's going through it, and he hates it. Because it's all he has, so he's got to do it. And then at the end of the movie, Al Pacino, no, De Niro comes to him and he says, I got a job right now, yes or no, bank robbery, got to get in, you want to do it or not? And he thinks for a second, yeah. He goes and he does it. And of course he gets killed. So I interviewed so many people in prison. I've never interviewed one guy who said he was coming back to prison. I interviewed many people that I was with that came out and came back and came out and came back. And I'd always ask them why. And their response was, there was nothing out there for me. I couldn't get a job. The job I got, there was no future in it. I didn't know how to live out there. Prisons where I know how to live, I just felt like I could do it. And that's what happens. And that's why my job is to show them they can become something more. And that's my approach to it is to show them stories like Sean Hopwood, or stories like Malik Wade, or stories like Abdullah, guy, the guy. So many stories of guys who did it, and show them, and make them believe they can do it too. And that's what I try to do with Earning Freedom. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Is that your baby? It is, yes. What's your baby's name? Maddox. Maddox is now on YouTube. Oh, famous. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Ashley. I'm a social work student, and I'm wondering what work you do with um, at-risk, like inner-city youth, youth, to stop them from entering the system in the first place. I think that's a great question, Ashley, and thank you for asking. And that's also part of the job of the Earning Freedom podcast. I also interview 
kids who went into prison at 13, inveterate gang members telling their story, but now are students at UCLA or are students at USC, and they're on the podcast and they're talking to others. And the same thing, I want help in spreading these podcasts into those schools for at-risk youth because they're not going to listen to me. And I always tell, there, there are people I will never connect with, but the guys on the podcast can. And so it's just a matter of delivering them that message and having this vision for every American citizen to realize I can become something more if I just learn how. A lot of those kids don't understand how. I go into juvenile halls, and I'll tell, I always like to tell this story. <laughs> I Thank you. I tell the story when I teach in at Santa Clara County Juvenile Hall in uh, this Bay Area. And I went in there once, and one of the kids asked me, what can you do for me if I get out of here? And I said, what, what would you like me to do? And he said, I'd like you to get me a job. I said, I can get you a job if you make a 100% commitment to living a law-abiding life. He said, but I still want to be a gang member. So there's this huge disconnect that they don't get it. And so that's why I try and introduce them to others who left the gang and are now students and, you know, it's what I try, that's how I try and teach juveniles, is just introducing the people who broke free. Hi. Hi. Um, I have a couple questions. Well, actually, I just have one question. Um, in relation to you being influenced by a movie, so how much of the like, media and social input have you found that has influenced some criminal behavior in the, these young people that you speak to who have been incarcerated? Well, I, you know, I, 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 don't, I was influenced by a movie, but at the end of the day, it was all my, my own lack of good character that, you know, a movie shouldn't have caused me to do what I did. I was just a misdirected, bad character. So do you feel that popular media um, that kind of glorifies violence in video games, do you think that has any bearing on... Without a doubt, I think it does. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, without a doubt, and that's big change. There's a lot of changes in society since I went to prison from now. And it would be very difficult to raise a child and have them not hearing about promiscuity or gang violence or drugs. and things. It's so popular now. And I believe that that is an out spread of mass incarceration because prison has become glorified in some communities. It no longer has the same stigma in some communities that it did when I was growing up. And people can't wait to get their stripes or their bones in prison. And that's bad. That's bad. And I, and I think we can do better. And I want to play a role, whatever role I can, in helping people make better decisions. Hi. Hello, sir. How are you doing? Um, thank you for coming out here. Thank you. <laughs> My name is Ruby. I'm a psych major, and um, I've heard that um, a lot of, there aren't a lot of psychologists um, in the prison system. And uh, one of my classes, we studied the case of a lady named Nin. I think that's what they called her, Nin. And uh, she said a lot of time they would just give a pill and not really do a whole lot of counseling. And I was just wondering, uh, what's your intake of, on that if you uh, were able to receive a lot of a counseling through the prison system? or I think that's a great question. And I don't know that everybody's going to agree with my answer. <laughs> but I think that psychology is a phenomenal profession and want to go out and serve and help people become better. And the prison system is in dire need, people like that. But I think something happens. Because <laughs> you go in there with that motivation, but then you're going sucked into this culture. And it's a culture that tells you you can't do that. You can't help people. It's a culture that tells you, separate. Don't sit and listen. Don't get too close. Don't give the type of therapy that you have been trained to do. They're inmates. They will lie. They will manipulate you. And it's a threat to security. So it's just this charade. I don't know if you ever studied Russian history, but there were these stories of the Potemkin villages. Did you ever read about that? So I think it was one of the czars. She liked to go through her community, and they built these facades 
of a beautiful, happy community. <laughs> and they were just facades. And she'd drive through the river and look at her community, and it looked like a prosperous good, but it was all just a facade. Behind it, there was nothing but poverty and recklessness and just terrible community. But that's all she saw. If you ever have an opportunity to tour a prison, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen in the federal system. All the inmates are going to be separated from you, okay? You're not going to get an opportunity to talk to the inmates. I remember I'd sit in those windows and I'd see these academic tours come in and I'd think, God, I wish I could connect with them. I'd do anything to be a human being again. But I was like an ape in a cage and I couldn't talk. And so the tours would go and they'd be, oh, and this is our educational program, and this is our shiny building, and this is here what we do here. And we've got, and all the inmates, we give them these phenomenal opportunities, and you know, it's what we're trying to do as staff, and there are these platitudes all over the walls. <laughs> Family ties are important, community ties do this, and then there are all these policies that make it impossible to communicate and hold family ties. And a psychologist, and you try and go and get help, and the psychologist is going to be, eh. If I help this guy, I'm going to be labeled as an inmate lover. <laughs> that's a career stopper, okay? And that's the problem. Because the system isn't about looking at the individual. It's about protecting security of the institution. And if I'm protecting security of the institution, a guy who's trying to get his PhD, well, that's a threat. Why? The guy's writing books in prison, that's a threat. Why? Because I'm sending a message out talking about what we can do better, and that's a threat. I don't want society knowing what's going on in here. And I don't want a psychologist talking with an inmate closely and talking about feelings and talking about what it's like to be separated from his child or when he's hearing that his wife is leaving him or that his child is now joining a gang and what can you do about it? I can tell you so many examples where inmates try to have these conversations with their kids over the phone and they get locked up. Threat to security. Can't be talking about that over the phone. And he's just trying to have a family relationship. And so there's just this massive investment in protecting security, every question is answered by threat to security of the institution. And so if you want to help people, you're going to be considered an inmate lover or a hug-a-thug, your career is going to end, you're going to get bad reviews, or you're going to go along with the program. And I think that's, a lot of people go into the system with a good heart and a good intention, but it's a system, and maybe some of you disagree with that, and if you do, come on up and, and share, but that's my experience and my perception. So do you feel like because they were so concerned on protection that they kind of separated them from what it's like to be human? Would you repeat that, please? Um, because they were so focused on protection, uh, it kind of separated the psychology from what it's like to be human? Like I, I, I just think that the system itself does not want any staff member to become too close to an inmate. And so there are barriers. And so the inmate who wants to get help cannot get help. And that's a problem. That's the formal structure. Now I can say informally, you may tell me I can't officially tell you this and you may work with me, but it's still just this, this really different world. And I think that psychologists who want to do well sometimes can't. Their career is at stake and they've got a family and a career and I got it, you know. But I think it's a problem. Thank Mental you, health is a problem in prison, you know. Those, those are real problems in prison. Thank you, Ruby. <laughs> Hi. Hi, so my name's Itzel, and I was wondering if I can make an announcement. Is that it's okay? okay with me. Okay. I so, made one. <laughs> so tall. Okay, uh, Team Read is a nonprofit organization that offers opportunities for high school students to do community service or uh, leave to tutor and mentor second graders struggling to read because those test scores will, res uh, will determine how many beds are made in the King County system. So if you'd like to, um, or if you know someone that's in the Seattle Public Schools that would like to earn their community service, that's a great way to get your hours in. Um, and they also accept donations. So the organization is called Team Read. Thank you. <laughs> And you know how to connect with her. What's your Twitter handle? <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> Hi. Let's see here. Hi, Michael. My name's Matt. Hey, Thanks Matt. for coming. 
Um, I have two questions for you. Uh, and the first one is uh, along these lines. When I heard you speak today, so a lot of the things you were talking about, there seems that there's, like there's multiple layers uh, to what you're talking about. And each one of the layers seems to have a variety of different issues uh, themselves. Uh, I heard you take some shots tonight uh, about mass incarceration in general, about the philosophy of locking people up. Then you spoke for uh, a while about sentencing guidelines and some issues uh, there, problems with sentencing in terms of length and things like that. And then there were also some, some talk about what's going on while you're in prison. So like re rehabilitative measures, things like that. So I would ask, what of those three do you think is the biggest issue uh, that we should be facing or we should be dealing with? And then the second question I had is you also made mention of um, nonviolent and violent offenders. And my question would be what or how, if any, does your opinion change um, on those two populations? Okay. So let's go one at a time. The first one is what is I think the biggest problem is? Of those, of those three that I mentioned. Mass three, incarceration. Sentencing guidelines. Sentencing. And then you know, like rehabilitative so, processes. <clears throat> on this title of this slide, it's sentence and prison reform. I write about that because I speak that they're interconnected. Okay? They're interconnected. I believe that we can do better as a society if we recognize that the day somebody comes into prison, it's not a very good predictor of how he's going to come out. Okay? So I think that we should reevaluate and assess the way we measure justice in the United States. It's really a radical, maybe um, innovative approach. I don't think it is correct to measure justice by the number of calendar pages that turn. I would much rather see a system that they can give a guy 40 years or 50 years, but also incentivize him to emerge as we would like to see citizens emerge, as law-abiding citizens. And in order to do that, I can't make that determination the day the guy comes in. When Sean Hopwood was arrested for robbing five armed bank robberies and using meth and being in the meth trade, and he came to prison, nobody could predict at that moment that he would eventually become qualified to get his law degree and graduate from the University of Washington Law School and become a clerk in the DC Circuit Court and now a law professor at Georgetown. Nobody could predict that. But I would submit that if we had a system in place that encouraged people to do that, it would influence sentence lengths, it would influence mass incarceration, and it would influence the third? The third. The rehabilitative process. Rehabilitative well, process. Well, yeah. More people, because why? If we didn't incarcerate as many people as we do, correctional officers and, and, and psychologists, they would have more opportunity to look at the people individually instead of as a mass system. I'm only looking at what's on the paper rather than how a person responds to the paper. So it's a big problem, and I think it requires both sentence and prison reform for it to become effective, but I think it, it, it would help every American citizen. So it sounds like the problem is not so much locking people up or for how long, it's what we're doing while they're inside. Would you agree with well, that? Well, I would also say it is, it is the, the extinction of, of, of hope. If robbing an individual of an opportunity or telling him you can become better, walk this line and build a better life and don't do it for me, do it because you see that you're going to empower yourself along this way. And in the process, you're going to develop these values that make you want to become a good citizen. And that's when you start changing the mindset. And that's when that guy starts to reject criminal lifestyle and criminal associates and starts looking for people like each of you to be in his network. And that's when he rejects crime. So, so then the last question is just how does, how does your philosophies or opinions change or vary, if at all? For violent and nonviolent? Exactly. So my, my philosophy doesn't change. I still believe that we should create mechanisms through which people can redeem themselves what those mechanisms are, what that individual must do, should be left up not to me, but to the citizens. You know, I think that 
Citizens should make a determination on whether somebody has earned freedom. They should just have that right, and the individual should have the opportunity to make that case. And we should encourage him, your job isn't to convince me, it's to convince each of you, because you're the community. And you're the community that's going to have him in your community someday. And if you want him back a certain way, I would encourage you to try and create a program that will make that happen. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess I was surprised to not hear you mention the right to vote. Um, do you believe that would be an important step or right for either inmates or uh, post-incarceration? I think it's a great, uh, a great uh, observation. I should have mentioned the right to vote because if, if you're incarcerated, you should have a, if you're a human, American citizen, you should have a right to try and influence the representatives that are controlling our tax dollars. And that goes right into the freedom of speech and the freedom of association. And it's another one of those areas that this great social injustice affects. I mean, people who are in prison, they don't have a right to vote for the representatives who are determining these laws that make them ineligible for food stamps despite them needing food stamps, that make them ineligible for public housing despite them needing public housing. They create programs for them to get an education. You know, people who've, who, are, who really need to come here on grants, they don't qualify because maybe they got convicted of a drug crime or things of that sort. So yes, it would be awesome to have the right to vote and it was my negligence in not bringing it up because it's a good point. Thank you for pointing it out. Thank you. Hi. I have a question about racism in the institution and colorblindness. In your Earning Freedom podcast, do you speak to that and how you propose to um, change a, an institution that relies heavily on racism and stereotypes of African Americans and Latino and Latina men and women? Mm -hmm. So what I speak about it is, I tell them that it exists. It's real. And I could spend my time in prison and I tell individuals coming out of prison who want to talk about that and things of that sort, that's a possibility. That's a one approach. But my always message is that you've got to, we've got to live in the world as it exists and strive to influence change and strive to change minds into a more enlightened society. And that's a heavy lift. But I also tell people, you can't use that as a crutch for not succeeding. Just expect it. Your probation officer may look at you a certain way. A police officer may, um, I forgot to profile you. Um, these things may happen. That's just life, not only for people in prison, but people anywhere in the United States. And it's just important to say, I want to change that. My message is only saying, I live in this world as it exists. Let's figure it out. Let's go on and let's build something great anyway. And, and it's one of the reasons I call to get more help because the, the job is so enormous and I'm only one voice and I just need help and I'm, you know, I w definitely want to bring awareness to it. Exactly. I, I think that um, when you, s earlier you spoke to, um, you were talking about citizenship and making sure that the people that you serve are also the ones that are helping you along the way and they should have a huge voice, um, that it's important that they understand uh, how that impacts them because once you get out of prison and you still have a society that's telling you um, you're no good because of the color of your skin. It's a terrible injustice. It's terrible. And it's so another I, social injustice and that's why I, I, I say this is a great social injustice that has enormous ramifications, intergenerational ramifications, but a lot of people don't know enough about it and I think the more content I can provide, the more stories I can tell, not only am I spreading awareness, but the people who are helping me are also learning more about it, too. Thank, Thank you. you. So we need to bring it to a close. It's past 8 o'clock. So if you could all help me thank Michael for coming today and tomorrow. Thank you very much. I really, really want to thank all of you, including Dr. Young and Dr. Ackerman, I, I really want to thank all of you for giving me this incredible honor of being able to come here and share this story with you. Thank you very much. I'll respond to any of the other questions that you
you have questions, I'm happy to talk.